I had the giggle. It's working. Yeah, get the it's giggle. giggle. Okay. Hello, my name is Norm Johansson, and this is Steve Roberts. We're both software developers at AWS. And I just came to a great conclusion that this is a queer highlight to go just after Jeff Bezos. It's not really very common. I have him to warm me up. So pretty happy about that. So what we're going to do today is we're going to take a, a, a .NET SQL Server based application. Uh, in our case, it's a photo sharing site called Cloud Shots. And we're going to deploy that to the AWS cloud. About a year ago, if you were to take a .NET application and you wanted to deploy that to AWS, your release process might have been something like go spin up a few EC2 instances, copy your application to all those instances, and then go and create and configure a load balancer, and then spin up another EC2 instance, install SQL Server, and then you got to figure out your whole patching and backup needs. So today what we have with Amazon RDS, which stands for Relational Database Services, we can create our SQL Server from there, and that can take care of all of our backing and patching needs. And then using AWS Elastic Beanstalk to host our application, that can take care of all of our capacity provisioning, load balancing, auto scaling, and application health monitoring. And using the AWS Toolkit for Visual Studio, we can interface with these services right from Visual Studio and be able to just right click on our project and say publish to AWS for our, to deploy it. If you haven't seen or installed the toolkit, um, you can download it from our website. It's at aws.amazon.com slash Visual Studio. Once you have that installed, you can, there will be a new menu item under the Views menu called AWS Explorer. This brings up this new window here. Up top is the list of accounts that we've got registered with the toolkit. The toolkit can support multiple accounts. And then is the list of regions that the toolkit supports, which supports all the regions, including GovCloud. Um, we're going to use US West 2, based out of Portland, Oregon, for today's demo. And then under there is all the services the toolkit supports in that particular region. So the first thing we need to do is to create our SQL Server instance. To do that, we navigate to the DB instance node in the Explorer, and we right click and select Launch DB Instance. Now, RDS supports MySQL Oracle as well as SQL Server. Today, we're going to use SQL Server Web Edition. Now, the first thing we need to do here is we need to specify our database engine. This is saying, do we want to use SQL Server 2008 or 2012? We want to use the latest and greatest, so we're going to use 2012. Then we need to choose the instance class, the, the size of the database we want. Our application is overall pretty small, so we're just going to choose a small database. Then we need to give our database server a unique name and put in a username and password. This is the admin password for essentially SQL Server. Up top here is the database port that SQL Server will be configured for when it's created. 1433 is SQL Server's default port, and it's usually fine just to use that. One reason you might want to change that value is if you want to connect to your SQL Server database locally, uh, your local network might be blocking that port. If that's the case, you'll need to work with your IT department and figure out which ports are accessible and use one of those ports. We're going to use the default security group. And then this checkbox at the bottom, what that does is by default, RDS is going to block all machines access to our SQL Server instance. There are two ways to add exceptions to that. One is by IP address, and that's what this checkbox is doing. It's going to add our laptop's IP address as an exception to that, to that security group. The other way to do that is based off of EC2 security groups. And that means any EC2 instances that are spun up in that, using that security group will also have access to that um, SQL Server instance. And when we deploy this to Beanstalk, that's how those EC2 instances will have access to the, the database server. So let's go ahead and push next. Now SQL, or RDS is going to do daily backups. Here we can choose what time of day we want it to take the backups. We can also choose how many days to retain backups for. We also can choose what time of day we'd want RDS to apply any system patches. Um, we're going to go ahead and just leave everything at the default for now. And now we can review our settings and go ahead and push launch. Okay. 
So this has brought up our RDS view, uh, instance view from the toolkit. You can see there's our new database. Its status is currently creating. It takes about 10 minutes or so for our SQL Server instance to become available. Um, we obviously don't want to wait that long. So Steve, shortly before the demo, created another um, SQL Server instance. And we're going to use that throughout the rest of the talk. So now that we've got our database, what we need to do now is configure our application to use that new database instance. So if we go back to our application's web config file, you notice there are a couple database connection strings. These are just using SQL Server Express as we were developing everything locally. Um, we're just going to go ahead and just delete those. Um, and Steve happens to have copied a, a skeleton version of our connection strings. These are just your standard SQL Server connection strings. But the things we still need to update are the data source for the newly created um, SQL Server instance. Uh, a quick way to go get that value is if we go back to the RDS view and we can select, uh, right click on our instance and select copy data source. And then we go back to the web config file and paste that in. We do that for both our connection strings. And then we just need to update the username and password. Don't look. <laughs> we'll spell it correctly, too. <laughs> and if our database was on a non-standard default port, like 1433, that copy would have post-fixed the, the port address on there for us. OK, so it looks like that's all good. Let's mm -hmm. go ahead and run this locally, make sure everything's working fine. Now, our application is an entity framework code first application, which means when it first starts up, it's going to go auto create our database and push in all of our schema and any sample data. So, our, our initial load can take uh, a little bit of startup time. There we go. There's pictures. That happens to be my wife for the shout out to her. And these are our pictures of uh, some of the t pictures from our. That taken by our team back in Seattle from the .NET team. Um, so let's go ahead and make sure that that application or that database was really used. If we go back to uh, the RDS view, we can right click on our database server and select Add to Server Explorer. This brings up Visual Studio's default uh, connection dialog box. We auto fill in as much as we can, so you just have to enter in your password and select the database that was auto created. There it goes. There's our database. And now it's important to remember, this is just SQL Server now at this point. You can use any tool that you're used to using for SQL Server. We're just letting RDS manage the instance for us, and it's going to take care of our patching and backup needs. And there's data. Uh, so now our application is configured with our RDS instance. I'm going to hand this over to Steve, who's going to walk us through how to deploy this through AWS Elastic Beanstalk. OK, so getting the database part of the application was pretty simple. We can use all our standard tools. We're good to go. Before we actually publish the application, though, there's a couple of things we want to consider. Basically, for the project settings, when they're living in the AWS cloud, do we need to make any changes? Secondly, once we deploy to Beanstalk, for those of you that aren't familiar with the environment, what does it look like? How is it structured? So let's consider the project settings first. So Norm, can you bring up the publish settings? Publishing to AWS from Visual Studio simply augments the existing publishing pipeline that you already have. We didn't take anything away. So what this means is that all of the publishing settings you can see in front of you are still relevant. You can still use these. You'll see that we've elected to keep the default of only deploying, uh, only deploying the files that the application actually needs to run. But we've made a couple of changes below. We've elected to remove, for example, app data content. We don't need it anymore. We're using RDS. We've elected to remove uh, program debug symbols. Um, let's keep the size of the web deployment archive down. And for this particular demo, we've elected to do uh, pre-compilation before we actually deploy out. You can also change the virtual root if you wish. Uh, all these changes are fine. When we actually deploy out to the instances, we'll use rewrite rules to surface your application at the root of IIS on the instance. So you have complete freedom here. In addition, 
If you're familiar with the web publishing pipeline in Visual Studio and the MS Build extensions, all of that's available to you. What we actually deploy is a web deploy archive. So again, if you're familiar with parameterization for web deploy, that's available to you as well. So you have complete flexibility in what actually gets published out to Beanstalk in this process. Now, once we actually do deploy to Beanstalk, what does it look like? Well, let's use the AWS Explorer to take a look. If we expand the Explorer node in the, uh, the sorry, the Beanstalk node in the Explorer, we can see for this particular sample here, we've got three top-level entries. These are Beanstalk applications. And as far as .NET is concerned, these correspond to your Visual Studio projects. Each application can have a number of versions stored away uh, at any given time. So if we actually uh, right click on one of those, um, let's use Shots Master, uh, Master Environment, and View Status, and then go to the Versions tab, we can see over time that we've deployed four versions of this particular application. But where is the version running? Well, if we expand an application node, we get what are known as environments. And each application can have a number of environments running simultaneously, running different versions of the application. So for example, if we expand the MVC test application one that we have here, we've got simulating three uh, release stages, the developer test, a release test, and a production environment. Uh, Shots Master is running with a single environment, um, quite simple. So it's pretty simple, it's pretty straightforward. There aren't many moving parts for you to worry about. The environment is where you'll find the AWS resources that are surfacing your application. So you get one or more EC2 instances, the load balancer, and the auto-scaling group. And later on, we'll take a look at a running environment and drill in some more, you know, some more of that information. So let's get started on publishing the application to match up with RDS. Now, when your application is running on the EC2 instances, it's being monitored for, he for health, basically. Every so often, a ping is sent, a simple head request, to a particular page in the application, um, and all we expect is a 200 response back, just to say, yeah, I'm still here, I'm still responding. If a given t uh, instance fails to respond for a, a particular number of times, I believe it's 10, uh, the instance will be recycled. The instance will be shut down, and a fresh instance started. You don't have to do anything uh, on, your, on your side to get that to work. Now, the default health check page is the root page of your application. And for most applications, this could well be fine. But for an ASP.NET application, you know, that could well involve some jitting uh, code compilation on the, on the instance, which for a health check, if the instance isn't being used, you know, potentially could be quite heavy. So a better practice that we recommend is that you dedicate a custom HTML page to that process. So Norm, can you add me a new HTML page? Sure thing. And we're going to call it pingcheck.html, just so we remember what we're doing with it. Now later on when we publish, We'll tell Beanstalk that this is the page it should target for the health checks. That's all we need to do to the page. It's only going to serve head requests. We can just close it down now. We're done. Now, the other two changes or best practices we've already made in the web config file. Um, so if we scroll down through the file to the system.web section, you'll see that we've already generated an ASP.NET machine key. Your application is going to be surfaced potentially on more than one EC2 instance. So to enable consistent encryption and, and decryption of view state, it's best to do this before you do your first deployment. Otherwise, while the application is live, a new instance is spin up for a redeployment, for example, you know, some customers that are actually hitting your site you know, may get a little bit confused. So do this first. The second best practice we want to bring to your attention, though, is probably far more important. If we scroll up through the file to the application settings, you can see here that we have embedded AWS access and secret keys. Now, for local testing purposes, this is fine. You may want to put in source control rules so that people don't check these into source control. That's fine. But when this file goes out to in deployment, it's going to exist in a zip file in S3. Now, that's fine. It's kind of secure. But it only takes one slip for somebody to make that file public. And your keys are potentially out in the open. So what we recommend that you do is make use of web config transformations to strip those keys out. And during deployment, there's an alternative method of getting the keys that the application needs onto the EC2 instances in an out-of-band manner that's more secure and doesn't leave your keys sitting in S3. The way we do this is to use web config transformations. Now, if you haven't used these, they're pretty simple to set up. You simply right-click on the web config entry in Solution Explorer, and you'll see an add config transforms entry. If you select that, Visual Studio will add one transform file per build configuration. 
So normally if you expand the tree, thank you, you'll see here we have a debug and a release config. Let's open up the debug config. Now all these are, are relatively simple rules for uh, controlling what actually what changes happen to the web config file during deployment. It doesn't affect local debugging. Okay? So here you can see two rules. They're just removing those access and secret keys. And we could do the same thing with the connection strings that we used earlier on. But to keep the demo simple, we're going to just leave the connection strings as they are. So with those two best practices uh, re uh, reiterated, let's get out and publish the application. And the way that we do this is right-click on the project in Solution Explorer and select Publish to AWS. And this launches the AWS Publishing Wizard. Now, the first thing that the wizard wants to know is what account is it going to publish the artifacts as? And this is not necessarily the same as the, as the account that the application is going to run with. In fact, we would recommend that it isn't. Okay? In addition, what region are we going to deploy to? In this case, we're going to go to US West 2 to match up with our RDS database. Now, this wizard can also be used to republish or redeploy applications. We'll see that later on. But for now, let's go ahead and pick to deploy a new application to Elastic Beanstalk. Now we get to start defining the application structure that I showed you inside Beanstalk itself. Okay, so we need to give the application a name, and we preset that from the Visual Studio project name. But that can be changed. You can add an optional description. And the bottom, you can see here an option called incremental deployment. Now, deployment can be done in one of two ways. Incremental, non-incremental. Taking non-incremental mode first, remember I said earlier on that what we actually publish is a web deploy archive. Okay, so that's a zip file. In non-incremental mode, the zip file is simply pushed up to S3, and then Beanstalk is notified of the new web deploy archive, and it will pull it down to the running instances. In non -incre sorry, in incremental mode, the toolkit will maintain, will create and maintain a local Git repository on your machine. It's uh, stored under the app data local folder, so it doesn't interfere with any Git repository that you have for your project itself. Okay. Um, and the web deploy archive is what gets committed to that Git repo. The contents of the Git repo, your archive, are then pushed out to S3 and Beanstalk. Um, but now, what this means to you is that on an initial deployment for both modes, they're pretty much the same. In fact, incrementally slightly slower because of the Git uh, commit. For the S3 mode, the non-incremental mode, the same deploy zip file, same size effectively, depending on what you've added, is pushed up to S3 each time. So you have relatively large files depending on the size of your application. With the incremental mode, though, only the changed files get committed, and only the changed files get pushed out to S3. So it makes for a faster redeployment experience. You can switch between these two at any time you like. For a given project, you don't need to be locked into any particular mode. Um, so for now, we're going to stick with incremental and move on. Now we need to give a name for our first environment. And this name is set or is used to actually preset the URL that your application is going to be surfaced at. We can check that it's available. If it's not, we can change it, but we're good. So let's move on. So now we need to define some of the AWS resources that the application needs. Remember, you're going to get the load balancer and the auto scaling group anyway. You don't need to worry about those at this stage. But what we do want to decide is, do we want to deploy to Windows Server 2008 or Windows Server 2012? And that's the meaning of the uh, container type at the top. We're going to go with, solution, with uh, 2012 today. And we can select the size of the EC2 instances to launch. So rather than stick with the default of a micro, let's today push out the boat and use an M1 large. Now, a key pair is actually quite useful in deployment purposes, and we'll see why later on. It's basically just a simple key, uh, private public key cryptographic item that can be used instead of a user ID and a password to connect to the running instances in a very slick and very quick manner inside the toolkit. If we drop down the combo, back, the combo box, we can see we've got a number of key pairs already, but let's go ahead and create a new key pair for this deployment. Okay, and move on. So now we're into actually defining the application options. Remember earlier on that we added a custom health check page? This is where we get to specify to Beanstalk. This is the page it should use. And we also stripped the access and secret keys out of the file, of the web config file. And this is where we get to tell it which keys to use. Now, we have a couple of options. We could type in, well, if you really feel like typing in an a secret key, um, the actual access and secret keys into these fields. That's marginally better than putting it in the web config file. But a much better approach is to use an identity and access management user account that in particular is locked to only the actions 
that the application needs and only the resources that it needs to touch. Now later on we'll show you actually how to do this. For now, let's go ahead and select use an IM user and we'll use our CloudShots demo user that we already have set up. And move on. Now, this page, the RDS database page, is only shown if you actually have RDS instances. And what it's basically asking you as a convenience is, you're going to launch EC2 instances. And the security group associated with those instances, do you want it to be able to talk to your RDS databases? In our case, the answer is definitely yes. Okay, so we deployed with the default RDS security group, so let's go ahead and check that and move on. And that's it. We get our review page, and we can select to deploy. So when we click deploy, the wizard disappears, and the build and publishing pipeline kicks into effect. So the first thing is the project is built, make sure all the targets are up to date. Once that's done, we invoke either an MS build package command to get the zip file of the web deploy archive, or if we're deploying a website project which has no project file, we'll talk to web deploy on your behalf to generate that zip file. Once the zip file is built and ready, we'll then start looking at whether we're doing incremental or non-incremental. If non-incremental, right now you'd be seeing an S3 set of progress indicators as we upload the zip file to S3. Here you can see that we're actually committing the uh, archive locally. Uh, starting the deployment out, incremental deployment. Yeah, so right now the toolkit is creating the Git repo under app data local. There we go, it's done. And we launch and an environment window comes up. Now, the first couple of times you do this, it's really exciting. You'll sit and watch these events come through as, as the environment launches. When you've done this a few hundred times, it's not quite so exciting. So what we're going to do is switch away to our running environment, Shotsmaster, and just take a look at what we can glean from a running environment and what we can do with it. So let's open up the view. And you see here again, we have the event trace. And if you want to get to the, uh, the URL surfacing the application, you can just click the link in the top uh, left-hand corner. Events again, uh, not really not that interesting. Let's go to the monitoring tab. So in here, we surface CloudWatch metrics for the EC2 instances that are serving your application. So you can see processor load, throughput, et cetera, et cetera. On the resources tab, we can see the various AWS resources in use. So one or more EC2 instances. If we scroll down, we can see details of the load balancers and the autoscaling group. This information, though, isn't static. Once you deploy, you can change this. So, for example, if we go to the server tab, we can change our EC2 instance type. Uh, if we go to the load balancer tab, then we can change the ping check interval or the health check page if we decide that we don't want to use ping check anymore. If we go to the autoscaling group tab, rather, then we can control how many, the minimum number of EC2 instances that we want to run at any one time or the maximum. Right now, we're running Shotsmaster with a minimum of two instances. Let's really push the boat out and go up to three. And click Save Changes, and it'll done. So while we're now talking, a new EC2 instance is being spun up, and the correct application version is being deployed down to it. And away you go. Now, there's a few other tabs in there that we're not going to cover today, but one that we did want to bring to your attention is called Logs at the bottom. Sometimes you just want to have a quick look. You know, is it really running? OK, did I really deploy? So if you click on the Logs tab, and then click the Snapshot Logs button, you see, we get, what happens is we're reaching out to the various EC2 instances that are serving your application and gathering up a set of logs. You'll see here now we have two log entries for two different instance numbers. If we click on one of those, we get to see the consolidated logs from the instance. And we can scroll down here and see the deployments, the health checks, et cetera, et cetera, that have gone on over time. Going back to the toolkit, sometimes, though, just looking at the logs in the toolkit uh, is probably not enough. You really want to delve a little bit deeper onto the running instance itself. And the way that we do this is by using remote desktop. And so if we click connect to instance, now the toolkit, remember we've got two running instances right now and a third being spun up. Okay? So the toolkit wants to know which version do we want to connect to. So let's pick one of them, hopefully one that's actually running, not the third one. Okay. We get this mini dialog here asking how are we going to connect to the instance, user ID and password or EC2 key pair. Remember that we created a key pair earlier on? Let's just click OK. Remote desktop launches. Boom, we're on the instance. Okay. So let's go, while we're here and the deployment's running, let's go and take a look at some interesting stuff. So firstly, where are those logs that I just showed you? And this is, it used to be how you had to go and get the logs from the instance. So we got into uh, program files and the Amazon Elastic Beanstalk folder, host manager. 
logs. And in here you can see four subfolders. Um, and these are the various log categories that were returned in that snapshot logs view for that particular instance. Okay? But where is your application? Well, we know it's an IIS application, so let's go to the root of INET pub, WW root. And here you'll see a cloud shuts underscore deploy folder. That is the contents of the web deploy artifact unpacked on this machine and servicing the application. If we go into that folder, and let's open up web config. Just want to show you something. You'll see at the top in application settings, there are no keys. They've gone. Whew. Okay, this is good. But where are they? Well, let's close that web config, step up one level, and open up the web config at the root. And there you'll see at the top of the rewrite rules, servicing your application, even though it's in a subfolder, as the root of IS on the instance, and down below, the access and secret keys. So they were transmitted to the uh, EC2 instance out of band, away from the web uh, deploy archive that's in S3, nice and safely. So with that done on the instance, let's go back to the toolkit and see how our current deployment's doing. And it looks like we're adding instances into the environment, so a few more seconds should do it. Norm can now play whack-a-mole with the toaster that pops up when it's done. But in the meantime, let's kind of have a quick look at some of the additional artifacts that we created during deployment. The first being the key pair. So if we open up the Amazon EC2 node, to work out on key pairs, you can see here a list of key pair names and uh, signature information. And the green check mark on the right means that both parts of the public and private key are stored by the toolkit securely on the local machine. And that's how we are able to get the remote desktop to work so seamlessly. All right. What about the web deploy archive itself? I said it exists in S3, so let's go and take a look. Open up S3. And in here we'll see a couple of folders. You can see uh, the MVC test applications, our shots master. This is what it looks like if you use non-incremental mode. There'll be a folder name, and that contains the application, or a key, I should say, and that contains the application version, the zip files that are web deploy archives. There's also one here with a rather strange name of Git and a very long sequence of digits. That was our current deployment that's just been sent out. Um, so let's go back and see how are we doing on deployment. It's still adding the instance. <laughs> let's give it a few more seconds. Actually, while we're, doing, while we're waiting for it to come up, let's go and take advantage and take a look at a few of the other tabs that we can see in front of us. So we've got notifications that we didn't look at. Here you can configure an email address, so any uh, significant activity will be sent out to that email. Uh, container, here again we can see access secret keys uh, that have been recovered from the instance. What would you use parameters for? Um, it's an easy way, like if you want, because basically those parameters, they get injected in the web configs app settings section, so if there's just something you wanted to inject that way, that's how you could use it. So. Mm -hmm. And under advanced, we get a whole stream of useful information. Click on events. Okay. Yep, there we go. So we can see availability zones here. This is how we can change set up availability zone setups. And scrolling through there, we got you can see the key pair name that we used. So a ton of other information that you can change and apply to configure your running environments. There it is. Hey, toaster. Right, click. <laughs> so now this is our application service on Beanstalk, talking to our RDS database, and. Uh, as you see, it's relatively simple to deploy out the application. So when it comes up, there's a little bit of warm-up required, obviously, um, although this time at least we're not creating the database. Um, Norm's going to click around a few images, um, and we'll see that the application builds up a list of the last five uh, images that you clicked on, on the right-hand side, when it spins up. You know, I should have used wireless, not wired. It would have been faster. Oh, really? Can we give that a try? We can switch now. <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Let's just use the Shots Master one. Let's go back to that one that we have on the first tab. Okay. The application run. It'll come up eventually. Right. So let's just click around some views here. So you'll see on the recently viewed column here, we're going to get five images. Did you click? I did click. I have to look at this guy all week. Like, uh, I know. Yeah. I'm a sniper. Oh, wait. I think this came up. Ah, there we go. Yeah, and you'll see actually we had the same initial load, so we're using the RDS database, whereas the Shots Master was using a different initial seed. So we click around. So you'll see here we've got this buildup of images that we've clicked on on the right hand side of the screen. It all seems to be fine, but there's a hidden problem. Right now, that list of images that we've clicked on is being held in session state on the EC2 instance. All right? 
we can spin up any number of EC2 instances and certainly we can scale them down, right? That session state is not going to, trans is not going to uh, cover uh, if the load balancer sends the user to a different instance or if an instance is recycled because of ill health. Now, the standard way to, to, the, to do this, the pattern to fix this, is to actually take the session state and move it to an off-store, an off-instance database. And, you know, we have an RDS database running here. We could do that quite simply. But, you know, that could be a little bit heavyweight for our purposes. What we really want, you know, is something that's fairly low latency, high speed, really nothing more than a key value pair. And it so happens we have such a thing, and it's called Amazon DynamoDB. You've probably heard a lot about it at this conference. And to sweeten the deal, earlier this year, we published an extensions library for the .NET SDK, the AWS .NET SDK, um, that contains a drop-in ASP.NET session state provider that talks to DynamoDB. And adding it to your project is a snap. So let's get started with that. So the first thing that we have to do is simply add a reference to a new extensions package, uh, which you can fetch from NuGet. Uh, right now, we're going to use a local NuGet reference. And what you're going to be looking for is a package called aws.extensions. Now, when you add this package to your project, it adds two things. Obviously, a, a, an assembly reference to the extensions library itself. The second thing it adds is a sample configuration file. And that, can, that file contains the entries that you need to make to webconfig to enable this in your application. You can see here that it's just a simple session state entry for system.web. So let's go and swipe that. And we'll add it to our web config. OK. So the session state provider needs three pieces of information. Firstly, what region should it run in? Obviously, it's going to need to run in US West 2, which is where our application is running, so we'll change that. The second piece of information it needs to know is the table name. Now, the, se the session provider will actually create the table for you if it doesn't exist. But to show off the toolkit, we thought we'd actually do it by hand. So let's swipe the table name. And if we right click on Amazon DynamoDB in the Explorer, we can select Create Table, paste the table name. Now, for the session state provider, we only need a simple hash key. Um, so I'll just put something simple in. For the purpose of the demo, we don't need basic alarms. So let's just turn those off and click OK. Now, while the table's being provisioned, let's consider the third piece of information. And you'll see here that it's access and secret keys again. Now, we could put, again, put access and secret keys in here, but I'll reiterate, this file is going to go to S3. So we really don't want to do this. It turns out that if we delete these two lines, well, I say it turns out, we wrote the code, we should know. Um, if you delete these two lines, the session state provider will fall back to the application credentials that the application itself is using in app settings, which we know are already being transferred in a much more secure manner. Now, we said that we used an identity and access management user when we did that. Let's go and see what that user can do. So we'll open up the tree and click on our Cloud Shots demo user and go to the Policies tab. And you can see here that we've got a policy in effect called Uploader. Now this policy, by default, only has the Amazon S3 actions that the image upload capability of the application needs. So in other words, upload to a particular bucket and make that image public. If we go to the Resources tab, we can see that it's the lockdown to the specific bucket where the images are stored. Now, we could change this policy and add in the, the relevant DynamoDB entries that we need. But a cleaner way of doing it is to just add another policy. So let's go ahead and do that. Give the policy a name. Now, by default, when the policy comes up, everything will be enabled. Okay? So let's turn everything off. And for DynamoDB, we just need a certain set of CRUD operations. We've already created the table, so we don't need to worry about that one. We need delete item, describe table, get item, put item, and update item. That's all we need. This is a good start, but we can go still further. If we go to the Resources tab, we know that we only want it to access a certain table. Right? So we could, enter, we could type in the, the resource ARN of the DynamoDB table here, but a much nicer way of doing it is to simply click the table in the Explorer and drag and drop it on the view. And it'll preset the ARN for us. Okay? We save the changes away. Now, if you were creating a new IAM user for your application and you needed to get the access keys, here's how you do it. Click on the Access Keys tab, okay, and you'll see here that we've already got access keys set. You'd click the Create button. This will give you a dialog that show you the access and secret key that has been generated that AWS will only return once. And on that will be an option that says Save these in the toolkit securely. Okay? When you do that, you'll get an entry in this view where you see Access Key. And if no one clicks on it, as you see there, you can get to the Access Secret Key data. And you can recycle keys very quickly in this way. 
But obviously, if you recycle keys for a deployed application, you'll need to redeploy to get the new keys across. Okay? So with the policy in place, let's go ahead and we'll run the application. But before we do, let's just open up the new session state table. Just to make sure there's no smoke and mirrors going on here. You'll see it's got no content. Okay? So let's run the application locally. And when it comes up, we'll just click around a few images to generate some session state. Let's go back to the toolkit and take a look at the table. There you go. Session state's in. We're good to go. So now we can redeploy the application. And the way we do this, as before, let's right-click on the project and select Publish to AWS. I said that the wizard could be used to republish. So what the wizard does when it starts up, it goes looking for all of your running Elastic Beanstalk environments and CloudFormation environments that were deployed from the toolkit and presents them for you in this environment. So we can actually take this project and redeploy to different environments. It doesn't have to necessarily be the one that we used. Okay? Now, and, and you'll notice that when it came up, um, it actually pre-selected the last environment that we used for this project. The toolkit's tracking where, where the deployments went. But in this particular case, all we actually want to do is republish content. We don't really want to change any settings. So there's a faster way than, use, than using this wizard. Let's cancel out the wizard and right-click on the project again. And you'll see underneath Publish to AWS, there's a Republish to Environment. The toolkit knows the last Elastic Beanstalk environment this project was published to, or the last CloudFormation stack that we published it to, and offers that as the choice. If we click that option, we get a simple one-page wizard that summarizes the environment or the stack that we're going to. We can double check it, we're all good, and click Deploy. So again, the publishing pipeline kicks in. We build all the targets up to date. Then we'll get the package built. There it goes. And we're going to start the incremental deployment out to the local Git repo. Now, remember that earlier on we turned on pre-compilation with this application, but even though we've only changed one file, right? So you'd, you're probably sitting there now thinking only one file is going to be committed. Not quite. There's a few extra files that were generated during compilation that will go in, but it's not too bad. There you go. Finished incremental deployment. So it's pushing it out. Let's go back to the environment for the app. And if we go to the events window, this is one of the few times when the events is actually exciting. You'll see, here, always exciting. <laughs> you'll see here on the right-hand side, it says waiting for two seconds to deploy. There we go, we're redeployed. And if we click that, bring it up, and the application's running. So that's how easy it is to deploy your application and redeploy real-world changes directly within Visual Studio. Normie's now going to switch over and show you how you can do the same thing from the command line. <clears throat> yeah, so now that we've done that, a lot of you probably wondering, I'm running Team Foundation Services or Jenkins or some other build process, and that's how you want to push out your, your bits through that. So what we have to accommodate that is we ship with the toolkit a command line tool called ADBus deploy.exe. Um, if you install the toolkit, you'll find it under Program Files, ADBus Tools, Deployment Tool. And what this tool will do is it will take the web deploy archive and either deploy to brand new environments or redeploy to existing environments. And to create your web deploy archive, you can just use MS Build from the command line with an extra switch to say, hey, package this up. To demonstrate that, what I did is I created a simple init script. Um, init is a, it's a building scripting tool, pretty similar to MS Build if you're using that. Um, the way it works is there's a collection of targets. In our case, the first target is a package target, which is what calls MS Build. It's going to take in our project that we wanted to use, and it has the extra package switch. And then the second target is our redeployment target, which has a dependency on package, which means this, that we'll always be sure to package everything up before we run this target. And this is takes the command lines. The dash R is for telling AWS deploy, let's do a redeployment. The dash W is telling AWS deploy, to wait until the stack's whole environment status has gone through updating and then back to healthy before actually exiting it out. Otherwise, it'll just send up, hey, there's a new version, and then exit right out. And then the final third option is a config file. That config file is what tells AWS deploy what application you want to, this is the Beanstalk application you want to deploy to, and when, what environment you want to deploy to. It also contains the credentials that you want to use to do the deployment with. 
And then also let's say, where is the web deployment archive at? Um, we ship a, the AWS AA tool with several sample files that you can use to help get started writing that file. Um, it shows you how to do some of the more advanced settings you want to do. But a really easy way to get started with this file is if we go back to the toolkit and we select our environment in the Explorer, we can right click and select Save Configuration. This is going to generate that file based off of the settings that are currently on that environment. I'll go ahead and uh, that's done. We can check the checkbox to take a look at that file. So you can see in this file, it's got the application that we're using. If we scroll down, I think it, it'll, well, I think it does. <laughs> it shows the environment that we're going to deploy to. And also note, it does have your credentials. So you do want to be mindful of how you're handling this file. Um, the one thing that we still do need to do with this file is we need to update the deployment archive location. Um, that's in our in-app script. So I can just go ahead, I can make Steve just go ahead and copy that value out and we'll paste it in. Don't forget to uncomment the file or the line. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yes, very important. <laughs> so that's all we need to do. Now we could run this from the command line. Uh, I'm going to have Steve make some sort of code change for us, though, before we go so we can see this in action. Let's see what exciting thing he does for us. Mm. Pressure is on. Actually, no, that's not the file I want. This is the file. So all I'm going to do is just change the logo image. There we go. Logo to. All right. OK. So we got a change. Run, the way you run in-at scripts is you just go to the command line, you type in-at, um, and that runs the build script in that directory. Again, this is very similar also to MS build if you guys are using MS build to script out your things. So you can see first it's running package, so that means it's going to compile everything. So it's a huge wall of text there. Then it's building up the web deploy archive for us. So now, now it's moved on to the redeployment stage. Um, Interesting to note about this is since our config file didn't contain a Git repository location, it's going to default to the, the S3 file upload method, which is what we're doing right now, it looks like. Mm -hmm. That's done. Now it's, telling, now it's just telling Beanstalk, hey, there's a new application version. Go install this for us. So let's go back to our environment status page. And yet you can see the status has already changed. It's going to updating. Should just take a second over here for it to go back to healthy. How big was your new logo? Oh, it's huge. Huge? Yeah. Well, they are really big screens. Well, that's right. why I thought. That's why I went for a big logo. Yeah. There we go. Two seconds to go. Or well, waiting. There we go. Okay. Now let's click our link, see it in action. And the new logo. It's not that big. No. <laughs> All right. um, so that's how you can do read point. So you can imagine anything that basically you can call it to command line. You can figure out how to automate that process through. So that's really what we wanted to show as far as how to use the toolkit. We have a few final tips that we wanted to just talk about. The first is it's really important to think about these EC2 instances as something that's kind of throwaway. Never store state on there because auto scaling can come up and decide, hey, I got, you need a new instances or you, now you don't need that instance and then it will essentially tear that down. So any stored state on your there would be lost. So, uh, and as Steve showed, using IAM is a great way to help lock down what your applications um, can do. Um, and using the custom uh, health check page, another good tip there. And also, consider using multiple availability zones. Uh, you saw when we went to the Advanced tab, there was a few options in there you can use to configure that up. So that's our tips. Thanks so much for coming to our talk. I really appreciate that. I hope I was as good as Jeff Bezos. We'll, you know, we'll see. Um, so.